Dave Galair, Thafal Chamur, we've got then a good day, Shimsa Tira, Adrali. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bridget McAuliffe, and on behalf of myself and my co organisers, Owen O'Shea and Dr. Mary McAuliffe, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you here today in Sheen Satira, both in person and online, for our first full day of conference papers. We would like to thank our partners, UCD Gender Studies, Kerry County Council, Kerry County Library and the Department of Computing, Creative Media and Information Technology at Munster Technological University, Kerry Campus. The Kerry Civil War Conference is supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sports and Media under the Decade of Centenaries Programme 2012 to 2023. Um, I would like to ask everybody to take their seats and uh, turn off their phones or put them on silent, please. Staff from Sheen Satira will be here all day and they will answer any queries you have about the uh, facilities and services in the building. As all tickets for in-person attendance for today and tomorrow is almost fully booked, we would encourage people to share our live stream details with anybody you think would like to join online. We will be streaming all of the conference papers but not the evening events. We had an excellent first keynote last night from Professor Dermot Ferreter of University College Dublin, and I have no doubt that there is an outstanding series of presentations, panel sessions and keynote address in store for us between now and five o'clock this evening. Our first panel session will run until half past 11, when we will have a 30 minute break. Teas and coffees will be available to purchase in the foyer during this time. We're back in the auditorium at 12 noon for the next panel session, which lasts until half past one. We then have a lunch break for an hour and return for our second keynote address from Dr. Leanne Lane at half past two. At half three, we will have a 15 minute comfort break. Our third panel of the day will begin at quarter to four and run until quarter past five. All these details are in your program, so if you haven't won, you can pick them up in the foyer or from the ushers. The conference exhibition, Michel Lamas, is on view in the Sheem Satira Gallery, and we would encourage all of you to look at it during the breaks, as it is an outstanding production from the students of MTU Kerry Campus and Kerry College here in Tralee. O'Mahony's Bookshop will be selling books by many of our speakers during the day in their pop-up shop, and that will be open during all of the breaks. Tonight, we are screening the drama documentary Ballysidi, and this is fully booked out. There are a number of seats still available for our concert, Their Memory Will Endure, Civil War in Kerry, which takes place tomorrow night at 8, 8 o'clock. Tickets can be booked at the box office or online through Sheem Satira website. It now gives me great pleasure to hand you over to the chair of our first panel today, Dr. Dahi O'Koran of Dublin City University. Thank you. Thanks, Bridget, and uh, good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to our first panel, and it's a great pleasure for me to chair that panel. Um, the title of the panel is Civil War in Ireland. We have three uh, excellent uh, speakers who are going to give us very thought-provoking uh, papers. The first speaker is Liz Gillis. Liz needs no introduction. Uh, Liz is from the Liberties. She is the author of six books on the Irish Revolution, including Women of the Revolution, and more recently, The Hales Brothers and the Irish Revolution. Liz uh, lectures at Camplin College in Dublin and is the South uh, Dublin County Council uh, historian in residence for the decade of centenaries. The title of Liz's paper this morning is Easter Week Repeats Itself, The Battle for Dublin, June, July, 1922. Thanks, Dahi, and uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Mary, Bridget and Owen for the invitation to speak at the conference this weekend, and it's fantastic to be here. But um, I'm just going to get started because the Civil War in Dublin, as the title sort of suggests, is 
is pretty much a, a repeat of what happened in 1916 in Dublin, in that the anti-treaty IRA seems to just completely forget the tactics, the successful tactics that were used um, in the War of Independence. But in the early hours of the morning of the 28th of June 1922, this ultimatum was sent to the garrison who were occupying the four courts sent from Tom Ennis, basically demanding that they surrender. And anything that happened, if they didn't surrender, was the fault of the anti-treaty IRA. There was no response to this ultimatum. And at seven minutes past four on the morning of the 28th of June, 1922, the bombardment of the four courts began. And the people of Dublin, the people of Ireland, woke up to read of this news in the newspapers, and in this case, the evening newspapers. The civil war had officially begun with this bombardment. Now, the four courts garrison, <coughs> despite the fact that they had been in occupation since April, were completely unprepared for this attack. And here we have a, a map showing the positions in the four courts. So the Anti Treaty IRA, a garrison of about 180 men, and um, they were split up in three areas throughout the complex. So we have the headquarters block, which would face out onto the Bridewell, the police station. Um, you have the four courts, the main dome area face now onto the Liffey. There would be a few people there. But the most important important area, the most important building was the public records office, the area that we see circled. Now, sadly, um, in that building where we had housed all these precious, priceless documents um, were the orderlies. Um, the orderly section was made up of members of Nafina, who were the youngest members of the garrison. And this was something that Sean Lamas had a huge problem with because it was the most dangerous part of the complex, because that is also where the munitions factory was. And Sean Lamas was pushing throughout the bombardment to get the orderlies out of there because they were the youngest and they were the most inexperienced experienced, but that did not end um, to come to fruition. And here we have a list of some of the members of the orderly section that were based in the public records office. But to go back to the, the surprise that the, the garrison itself felt, how unprepared they were when the attack actually came, we have it from the words of those who are actually in there. And Ernie O'Malley sums it up very well, where he said, communications between the blocks was in the open, the dome area was cut off from the headquarters block, the latter from the records office, the space was covered with rifle and machine gun fire. One man was hit as he crossed behind me, Paddy O'Brien, who was actually the commanding officer, of the Four Courts garrison, and I found men to work in a sandbag barricade, but there were not enough bags to make a covered bulletproof passage between the blocks. So when they had occupied the building, they began to barricade it, but then it stopped. And there's amazing photographs of the garrison where they're posing on top of the roof, and um, they're posing with the armoured car that they had taken. There is not a garrison that is preparing for war, and when the attack actually happens, as we can see from a Mali statement, they are completely unprepared prepared. They are erecting barricades as the bombardment is taking place. But this surprise, it was not just felt by the garrison in the forecourts, because while the forecourts had been occupied, you also had other buildings occupied around Dublin City by the anti-treaty IRA, including Barry's Hotel and Gardiner's Row. They occupied Comanum Jail at one stage. But Word had been sent on the eve of the attack that an attack was going to happen. So pretty much the entire of the anti-treaty Dublin Brigade of the IRA were mobilised. And Sean Prendergast is one of those who, when word comes true, was at the La Scala Theatre with his friends. And as he says, what a rude awakening indeed. One moment we were in the height of merriment, the next we were plunged into the infernal affairs of an armed enterprise, mobilised the men, every man to his lot, a task. Soon the clarion call was brought to the four quarters of the city wherever our men lived, arranged in the dispatch of all our warlike materials to the selected rendezvous. No more bewildered and inquisitive party parades in the hall that night than ours on that fateful June night as they arrived in ones and twos to give effect to the orders they had received. So everyone, it seems, is completely surprised that the war has actually broken out. 
But the bombardment of the four courts, it lasted for three days. And we have from this account by Simon Donnelly, who again is actually in the four courts, he's on the ground. And he sums up what was happening inside. And when we look at the attack in the four courts and we see all those photographs, we know that the 18 pounders were used against the four courts garrison, but generally we only see two. Three guns were actually in, in the attack or used in the attack against the four courts. And what Simon Donnelly says, early on Friday morning, enemy launched a very heavy artillery attack on three posts of the building, supported by all other arms. One gun was moved up to Wine Tavern Street Bridge, Another was planted at Green Street at the rear of the courts and a sword gun played from the direction of Bridge Street. The bombardment continued for many hours. About 11am, incendiary bombs thrown into the GHQ block on which the chemical shop took fire owing to the inflammable substances in the building. Orders were issued to all men to retire to the other side of the court, that is the portion next to the quay. They got over by means of a tunnel which had been dug under the road. Myself and Father Dominic were the last to leave it. Shortly after GHQ, HQ block had been cleared, a terrific explosion occurred which shook the building to its foundations. A large quantity of explosives, some say as much as two tonnes, was exploded by the fire and roofs, windows, walls were falling in all directions. So this is the force of two massive explosions <coughs> that were to rock through the four courts. Now, while we have this attack from Simon Donnelly, we are very lucky to have an account from a Free State soldier who was involved, who was actually leading the attack on the four courts and is caught up in that explosion. And it's Porrick O'Connor, a member of the 4th Battalion of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, who went pro-treaty. And what he said, in a short time, it was observed that the block I was about to attack was on fire and that the fire was rapidly spreading. I received in return in order to attack immediately. I stood for a moment to give orders to the sergeant standing just inside the door. The block was blazing fiercely, the flames reeling across 25 to 35 yard gap that separated us. The heat inside the records office was unbearable. I had only started to instruct the sergeant when an immense explosion rocked the building. The building shook and the men were lifted off their feet and sent spinning around. This I could sense and see as I was propelled skyward with the sergeant. When I recovered and scrambled to my feet, the world was blacked out. I called out in order to evacuate the building. I was appalled as my men staggered out, blinded with dust and smoke, and in many cases covered in blood from cuts received from glass. Now, miraculously, um, no one was killed in this explosion. And we've seen the photographs of that massive explosion in the records office. But you can see that they were actually in the complex before the records office did explode. Um, shortly after that, we do have the second explosion. Um, there had been calls to surrender unconditionally. The garrison would not. But after this second explosion, there was no option and the garrison did surrender. They were marched out to the banks of the Liffey. They were taken prisoner um, to Jemison Distillery in Smithfield and then later transported um, to Mount Joy Jail. Um, and you would think that that was the battle for Dublin over, but it wasn't because the Four Courts is one of many buildings that were occupied by the anti-treaty IRA. And focus next, next shifted to what became known as the Block, that series of buildings at the top of O'Connell Street, um, on the eastern side of O'Connell Street, that the anti-treaty IRA, under the command of Carl Brewer, had occupied and tunnelled through to literally make a massive fortress. And it's literally that entire block of buildings. But in this um, document, or these documents, we can see the other buildings that the anti-treaty IRA occupied throughout Dublin City. Um, they had buildings in Granby Row, in Dorset Street, they had them in Ainger Street, um, you have the Swan Hotel there. It is all over Dublin. But what the National Army, the pro-treaty forces, decided to do was exactly what the British seemed to do in 1916, and was to focus their concentration on the block have an encircling movement. So by one position by one position, they would isolate the block completely encircle it until it was just completely surrounded. There would be no way out. And that is exactly what happens. And we see that happening 
in the first instance with the hotels, Morin's Hotel and Hughes Hotel in Gardner Street, which had been occupied by the Antitreat IRA. You have a train being brought up uh, to basically get into position at the Loop Line Bridge that was overlooking the position. And from there, the National Army bombarded the hotel. So you can see over the coming days, one by one, the Antitreat IRA positions fall until it is just a focus on the block. And what we see in use in the block is the 18 pounder guns, they are the armoured cars and the 18 pounder gun is put in position at Nelson's Pillar under the protection of the armoured cars and it was very vicious fighting that happened in O'Connell Street despite it being such a restricted area and we have this brilliant account from uh, the pension file of Marie MacDonald who is a member of Cumann and Mon, who's actually in the block um, and we see it throughout this whole period, love did blossom amongst the revolutionary and in the block, we have Marie MacDonald with her future husband, Austin. Um, and while she's caught up in this drama, all she is worried about is her sweetheart. And just to read out what she says, Anna Swep and I were told to go to bed at 12 o'clock. Anna went, but I refused. I was, I was expecting Austin. All she wants to do is to see her sweetheart. We got in a lot of free state prisoners late in the night and also some of the medical staff which evacuated Morins and Barry's. The North Nurses told me they had to crawl out of Morin's hotel. Such fearless souls as I saw all round me, the pale drawn faces, but all with a laugh and song. At last came Austin. I ran to him and we whispered in the hall through the din of noise and shooting. We had just got word that we would be shelled and to be ready with all our clothes on for any eventuality. So we said goodbye and we're glad that we would meet the same death together. Now, thankfully, they did survive. They went on to get married and live a happy life together. Um, but here we have these amazing photographs of the bombardment of the block and you can see the 18 pounder gun being brought into position. The photograph um, on the bottom right, it's a very to me, it's a very sinister photograph because there is an account of free state soldiers making their way towards the block and they see a person on the roof holding what seems to be a white flag and they thought that was the garrison surrendering and they make their way, they advance towards the building but all of a sudden the group are fired upon they weren't actually surrendering. They were trying to let the soldiers know that the ground floor of the building was mined. Um, and just looking at that photograph, you just wonder, is that moment before that event happened? When was that photograph taken? But it is a very eerie photograph. But just like at the four course, the bombardment, it continues. And you can see here the destruction. Literally, each building falls. They become untenable until finally you have a small garrison under the control of Cahill Brewett left in the Granville Hotel. Now, you had had 70 men uh, upwards of 30 women in the block at the beginning of the fight but Cattle Brewer he tells his garrison to leave and you have just a small group left. Now the National Army had gotten so close to the block they were actually in Thomas's Lane behind the block so you come out of the door of any of those buildings you are right in uh, the, 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 basically the presence of the National Army. And the small garrison, they leave. The National Army are in the laneway. There are calls for Brewer. Where is Brewer? And then Cattle Brewer emerges. Um, he was called on to surrender. Um, the soldiers were ordered to fire, but they were ordered to aim low, so as to wound, not to kill. But unfortunately, one bullet was all it took to take down Cattle Brewer. Um, his femoral artery was severed. And what British bullets and grenades could not do in 1916, it took one bullet fired by a fellow Irishman to kill Cattle Brewer. Now, Linda Cairns, who was there, she was anti-treaty, uh, part of the anti-treaty garrison. Um, she accompanied Brewer to the Mara Hospital. And it, there were signs that he was going to improve. Um, his condition was improving, but sadly, um, he succumbed to his wound and on the 7th of July, Cattle Brewer died. Now, with that one shot, 
in Thomas Lane, the battle for Dublin was over. However, as you can see from these newspaper accounts, the fighting in Dublin was to continue right throughout the Civil War, even beyond the Civil War. And we have here, it's not the conventional war like we see at the start in Dublin. We have reprisals taking, out, taking place. There are murder gangs operating in Dublin. And unfortunately, you have headlines like this every day, it seems, right throughout the period in Dublin of the Civil War. Um, but I can't end on that story. Um, this weekend is going to be very intense, and this is a very intense, tragic, sad period. I am going to end on a happy story. I don't think there'll be many of them um, in this conference. Um, and it's this story of a couple who got married on the very day, the same day that the Civil War began. And it was this young couple, Henry Cecil Bernardo and Helen Josephine MacDonald, who had had their own personal battles to get to this day. Um, they were married in uh, St. Andrew's Church on Suffolk Street, and they were caught up in the Civil War because while the couple were in the church getting married, their wedding cars were stolen, most likely by the anti-treaty IRA because their publicity department was just a couple of doors down. Now, if you look at Henry Cecil and Helen Josephine, oh my God, it's a brilliant story. Um, so he was the son of Bernardo's Furriers, which is still in operation today at the bottom of Grafton Street. And Helen worked in the shop and they fell in love. But his parents, his father in particular, believed that Helen was below um, Henry. She was not good enough for him. But to get the two of them, or to break them up, they actually sent Henry to Canada, where he became a lumberjack. And he was there for years. But when his father died, he inherited the family business, so returned to Dublin. And as it turned out, their love hadn't waned, and they rekindled their romance. And then they got engaged, and they set the date for the 28th of June, 1922, to an anniversary they would never, ever forget. But it made the newspapers, and we can see here um, Henry's reaction, where it says two motor cars were taken outside St. Andrew's Church, St. Andrew Street, Dublin, while the murder's going on between Mr. Wilfred Bernardo, they got the name wrong, and Mrs. Peggy, the two names wrong, MacDonald. Mr. Bernardo has been associated with more than half a dozen charitable institutions in Dublin, and he's one of the leading furriers in Ireland. Mr. Bernardo and his wife said to the Daily Mail reporter, we were married under a big bombardment, guns were firing all the time, but we are quite happy, we are leaving for London tonight. So literally, as this country was tearing itself apart. Uh, thank you, Liz. Now, our next speaker is John Dorney. Uh, John is an independent historian. He is editor of the wonderful website, The Irish Story, and he is author of Peace After the Final Battle, the story of the Irish Revolution, published in 2014, and more recently, The Civil War in Dublin, The Fight for the Irish Capital, published in 2017. John is currently employed on a project in UCC to map the casualties of the Irish Civil War, and the title of John's paper this morning is They Treated Kerry as a Hostile Country, National Army Reprisals in Cork and Kerry During the Civil War. No, oh, thanks very much, Dahi. Uh, ah, there's my talk. So, time is brief, and I have to I have to move fast. But I'm going to be talking about the most controversial aspects of the Civil War, and probably the reason why we've such interest in a conference here today, and that's reprisals. Now, my brief is to talk about National Army reprisals, so that will be the focus, not because of bias or prejudice, but because that is the brief. The subtitle I have here is treating Kerry like a hostile country, which is a quote from John Joe Rice, as we'll see, the commander of Kerry No. 2 Brigade. Before I launch into it, I'm just going to preface it with the way civil wars are fought tell us as much about how they're remembered as why they're fought. So it's difficult, I think, for us to imagine why people killed each other 100 years ago over the treaty. But what I'm going to look at here is I don't think people killed each other exactly over their disagreement over the treaty. They killed each other because of the dynamics of conflict and how it developed. So I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour, if you like, of Cork and Kerry, which were, together with Dublin, the three most violent counties in Ireland during the Civil War. 
So my quote comes from John Joe Rice. He said, the Dublin Guards treated South Kerry as a hostile country. So John Joe Rice is in charge of Kerry number two, which is South Kerry. Um, but I think this can be extended safely to most of the county. The Dublin Guards, of course, were the first unit of the National Army, the pro-treaty army. Um, in fact, their recruits came from all over the place, but the officers certainly were mainly from a coterie of Dublin IRA men who had been very close to Michael Collins and his intelligence department, and particularly the intelligence department's hit squad, the squad. John Pinkman, who was a, actually a Liverpool IRA man, said of the Dublin guards, Pinkman was stationed both in Cork and Kerry, he said, most of our lads were Dubliners and retained the Dubliners' traditional disdain for the Irish country people. So the civil war in Munster, especially in Kerry, has this very strong element of a foreign invasion, if you like. I say this as a Dubliner, of course, of, <laughs> of the south of Ireland. Cork and Kerry, between them, saw over 400 dead in the civil war, which um, in Cork's case is less than the war of independence, but in Kerry's case is more. Um, it sometimes overlaps. So in Ireland, we're very conditioned to think of counties as discrete units. But in fact, you see a lot of overlap. You see Cork and Kerry units crossing over the county border, helping each other in terms of the IRA. You see them sharing ammunition and rifles and so on. Um, you see, you have two separate commands of the National Army in Cork and Kerry after they land, but actually they also help each other. However, Cork and Kerry's experience of the Civil War is nevertheless different, okay? In short, it's much more bitter, especially the memory of the Civil War is much more bitter in Kerry. Now, in fact, slightly more people were killed in Cork, as far as we've determined, than in Kerry, but the character and the memory of the Civil War in Kerry is much more intense. So why was this? Well, first of all, the geography of the Civil War, you can see here, this is a map of pro and anti-treaty units of the IRA in the treaty split. And with the exception of the North, which is, of course, a separate category, it does tell you a lot about how the Civil War worked out. So the dark green is anti-treaty. And this is more or less where the Civil War is intense. So we see the first and second Southern divisions. First and second is, is down here. Uh, sorry, first is down here. Second is kind of Tipperary region. Uh, Third Eastern at the little corner in, in Wexford is, again, very active in the Civil War, much more than in the War of Independence. Uh, second Eastern is Dublin and also in the West. And this is basically where the Civil War is fought. I haven't done the exact calculations, as Dahi said, I'm working on a project to map the casualties of the Civil War, but I had a guess I would say those dark green areas are where 90% of Civil War casualties occurred. Now, the Civil War is brought to South Munster in August of 1922. So in July 1922, units from Cork and Kerry are up mostly at that yellow line there. They're trying to defend what's known in the press uh, so Jerry Shannon, my friend, who's here today, will tell you there's no such thing as the Munster Republic, but the press nicknamed it the Munster Republic. They're trying to hold this line. They're outflanked by seaborne landings in Cork and Kerry. So the landing is at Phoenix here in Tralee, or sorry, here in Kerry, near Tralee, and they march to Tralee. There's three landings on the Cork coasts, you can see there. Now, it's a very complicated map. There's a lot going on. But what I want you to focus on here is, you see the mountains. The mountains are helpfully outlined for us today in this map. The mountains and the geography play a big role. So West Cork and Kerry is a stronghold for the anti-treatyites. They regroup there after the landings in Cork and Kerry. They're plentifully armed for several reasons, but they're much better armed than they were before the truce. And it's in this part of Ireland where the most determined resistance to the Free State occurs. So this is Free State or National Army troops clambering off the boat at Phoenix. Um, Cork. The National Army Force is head by, headed by Emmett Dalton. Emmett Dalton, a former British Army officer, turned IRA, turned National Army. Um, Paddy O'Daly leads the landing at Phoenix. O'Daly is the arch squad man. He had actually been the head of the squad in the last days of the War of Independence. A very brutal man in many ways. But contrary to the, probably the stereotype of the Civil War in Kerry, it's not just a case of Dublin troops occupying Kerry, because a very, a very large element is also the First Western which is commanded by a man called Hogan, and they are former, mostly former IRA at the start from Clare and from Galway. Now, later on, there's actually troops from Belfast, believe it or not, on the Free State side, stationed in Kerry. Plus, there is also troops from Kerry as well, in Kerry, number one and number two brigade, the pro-treaty elements of them. So, they retreated from the towns, but regrouped as guerrillas, and as I said, they made the occupation of Cork and Kerry extremely difficult. Now, I want to zoom out for a minute. Guerrilla war. So, the narrative of the Civil War that we have is there's a very brief conventional phase, and then there's a guerrilla war, which lasts for some reason for a long time. And one thing I've been trying to push back on in the last year about in our centenary is 
it doesn't just drag on for no reason. It drags on because the anti-treatyites think that they can win. And for a short time, really, it looks like they are winning. So Liam Lynch, who is the head of the anti-treaty IRA, the chief of staff, abandons fixed positions, adopts guerrilla tactics, and in August, September 1922, it looks very much like this is working. So you have towns like Dundalk, Kenmare here in Kerry, Clifton, and among others, these are only examples, which actually fall back into anti-treaty hands in the autumn of 1922. Um, here in Kerry, you have large swathes of the county not under the control of pro-treaty troops. And Liam Lynch has a strategy. So Liam Lynch is um, often criticized for dragging out the Civil War pointlessly, but he had a strategy, and it was this. Economic warfare and sabotage, along with guerrilla warfare, would bring the free state to its knees. So what he says is this, we cannot hope to overthrow the enemy unless there is a big desertion or a complete change of the people to our side. I do not expect that we will gain a position to dictate terms to the enemy, but time is on the side of their army but against their government. I hope to bring it to bankruptcy and to make it impossible for a single government department to function. And this is what makes the Civil War what it is really, why it drags on for so long, because Liam Lynch's strategy is precisely to drag it on for as long as possible so that the Free State will go bankrupt. They will have to renegotiate the treaty. Now, how does this play out in Cork and Kerry? So this is in Cork. This is Emmett Dalton here, as I mentioned before, former British Army officer, then IRA, then National Army. And Dalton reports back in September 22, not that everything is fine, but far from it. Our forces have captured towns, but have not captured irregulars. Regular is, of course, the word for the anti-treatyites on a large scale. Our present dispositions are exposed to guerrilla warfare. We're scattered and easily to isolate, September the 3rd. I know the irregulars who caused me 17 casualties yesterday. It is better to try and execute them than shoot them out of hand when I catch them. So very early in the day, Dalton, for one, is pushing for executions, for reprisals, to try to terrorize the guerrillas out of this campaign, which is so difficult to deal with. Um, the situation, he says, is very bad in Mill Street, McCroom, Ballyvorney. It's a large concentration of irregulars, again, this word. Um, I only use this word in quotation marks, by the way. The same with things like Free Stater. Um, Ken Mayer is taken at this period, as I mentioned, and he says he has only 500 reliable men and he needs more men and rifles. So again, something about the Civil War is people wonder, why was the Free State or the National Army so large? Because they needed it, you know, because it was the only way to garrison the whole country. In Kerry, it's the same thing. W. Worry Murphy is in command in Kerry initially, not Paddy O'Daly. Murphy is of a very similar background, actually, to Dalton. He's a former British Army officer who joined the IRA for... Um, quite late in the day, I think, as a training officer, then was headhunted by Collins to officer the National Army because he had experience. And he reports something very similar to Dalton. He says, there's constant ambushes and casualties, and we can do very little effective with our present numbers. We are fighting against very superior forces in a mostly hostile country. This is Kerry. Now, one thing, just to flag quickly, is not everybody in Kerry is actually anti-treaty, but the IRA there is mostly anti-treaty, and there is this very strong perception in Kerry that it's an outside invasion, I think. So Murphy says, I need 500 men immediately, and Oriel House detectives and armor trucks and so on, and he says, we must show ourselves the top dogs to win the support of the population. Oriel House is the detective headquarters of the Free State, and the man he gets is David Nelligan, who will play a large part in our story. Theorists of civil war say it's a battle for control over civilians. Now, what the National Army generally says this is taken from their reports, is that people support the anti-treatyites because if they do, they don't have to pay taxes and they don't have to follow the laws in any way. This is what they say. So in Limerick, for example, owing to the state of lawlessness, they do not have to pay taxes. It's a mercenary motive. In Kerry, they say a large section of the peasant population will always follow the lead of anybody holding forth the prospect of evading their civic responsibilities. <laughs> it's funny, that doesn't get a laugh in Dublin, but there you go. They say the farmers shelter the irregulars not through love but through fear of their own skins. When the dread of the irregulars is removed, the majority of country people will be with us. So that's what they think is going on. Now, in, especially in Cork and to some extent in Kerry, people are initially quite pleased to see the National Army because, you know, the anti-treatyites have been um, occupying the place, they've been, you know, taking levies and so on. But this kind of quickly falls away because the National Army, especially down here in the south, tends to alienate people with their own behaviour. Now, for example, one of the things that you see in their reports is they, their idea of uh, patrolling is going out on a Sunday, surrounding the church at mass time, and you know, taking into custody all the men in the, in the church and then kind of beating some of them up. And they do the same thing at the dances that night on Sunday. So they don't endear themselves to the population. Now, the one thing I will say, however, is that neither side 
really target civilians that much in the Civil War, unlike the War of Independence, actually. So we see the figure there, 13 informers killed in the Civil War versus 200 before the truce. Okay. Now, because this is the case, because in this period of the Civil War, the National Army is actually taking far more casualties than the anti-treaty IRA, what you start to see is reprisals. Now, this is to Fianna boys in Dublin. Liz mentioned this in her talk. But it's the nature of guerrilla war. The regular troops are exposed, if you like. They're taking more casualties. They view it as an unfair fight. Now, the other side possibly saw it the same way. But there's also this mutual incomprehension. So a lot of the National Army soldiers, particularly the former IRA element, and this is interesting, they take it very personally. They say, we're the true soldiers of Ireland. We are the true IRA. These people attacking us are cowards. They're attacking us with ambushes, with mines, with bombs. We have no chance to defend ourselves. They're truceleers. They joined the IRA during the truce. Now, this is not the case in many cases, but this is what they believe. And so they start to take revenge. Now, this is just some examples from the rest of the country before I launch into Cork and Kerry. Um, the Fianna in Dublin, the two leaders of the Fianna in Dublin, uh, Colin Colley, they're laid out there, were shot in August 1922. The Red Cow Murders, three more Fianna boys. Now, just I select them because they were particularly shocking examples. In Sligo, as Dermot Ferreter mentioned last night, um, the Noble Six, so-called six anti-treatyites, were killed up in Van Bulben, probably after they surrendered. Now, in the whole of the Civil War, as far as we know, the figures are something like this. There's around 130 anti-treatyites killed when they're unarmed or prisoners, versus about 53 on the other side. So there is this feature of the Civil War where the National Army takes revenge because, essentially, I think, because more of them are getting killed in combat. Now, in Cork and Kerry, high-profile losses of the National Army. Michael Collins, of course, on August 22nd, but also uh, Tom Kyo, a squad member who's blown up along with six soldiers near McCroom, a place called Carrefuca, September the 16th. Uh, Tom, Kyo, Tom Kyo was on the top right-hand side of the picture there. That's a picture of the squad in their IRA days. In Kerry, Captain Jim Burke, another ex-IRA man, um, originally from Cork, but with the First Western, killed in August. Two medics from the First Western, again, Clare and Galway soldiers, killed near Killarney. And local IRA men, pro-treaty IRA men, the Scartine O'Connor brothers from Kenmare, who were killed in their beds during an attack on Kenmare on September the 9th. Now, we have a total of around 100 National Army killed in action by the end of September 1922. So, this is ripe for reprisals. They feel that they're in a hostile country, they're being attacked by people who are cowards and not the true soldiers of Ireland and so on. So this is what happens. This is some examples. This is, the picture is Jack Galvin. It's the first monument to Ballyseedy you know, opposite the main one. So these are some high-profile cases. Timothy Kennefick in Cork. Um, it's reported in the IRA as a particularly brutal murder, so apparently they dragged him behind a, a car after arresting him. James Buckley shot in reprisal for the explosion that killed Tom Kyo and his, bar his body dumped in the mine. Three volunteers killed at Upton. Allegedly, this is Tom Barry's statement, uh, on the orders of a National Army chaplain. Now, I, I have no further evidence, but that's what Tom Barry says in the pensions. In Kerry, the first one that anti-treatyites talk a lot about is a man called Moriarty in Tralee, who was killed apparently by a Captain Murray of the Dublin Guard. 17-year-old Bertie Murphy killed in reprisal for an ambush. John Galvin, the man in the picture, killed by First Western troops, the Clare and Galway troops at Ballyseedy. John Lawler, uh, given a summary court-martial by Michael Hogan, again of First Western. Now, these are just, you know, it's, it's a sad litany, but these are representative examples. Now, the reaction, however, in Cork and Kerry among National Army troops is quite different. And this might start to tell us about why the memory of the Civil War in the two counties is so different. So in Cork, the locally recruited troops refused to go back out and control, patrol until the culprits for the killing of Kennefick and Buckley, who were Dublin troops, were sent away. And Emmett Dalton reports back, the shooting of Buckley was the work of the squad. Now I personally approve of the action, but he says, the men in my command can look at scores of their companions being blown to atoms by a murderous trick without feeling annoyed. But when an enemy is found, they will mutiny if he's shot. So he says, it's better if you keep the squad out of my area. And the squad, member, officers really, are indeed sent home to Dublin, where they get up to much the same thing. It didn't end reprisal killings in Cork, but it certainly put a lid on them. And Dalton himself, who contrary to what he said afterwards, is actually quite bloodthirsty in the Civil War, I think, in terms of his, what he says anyway, is replaced by a local man, David Reynolds, in December 1922. Now, in Kerry, there is a very similar set of circumstances, but a very different response. So, Ned Horan, who was the leading pro-treaty IRA man of Kerry No. 1 Brigade here in Tralee, North Kerry, he raised an uproar over the killing of John Galvin. And Horan said, I tried to preserve the honour of the National Army, but such incidents only served to incite public opinion against the army, and if we carried on, we would find ourselves in arms against a hostile population, such as existed against the Black and Tans. 
But W. Warry Murphy, his response is quite different from Emmett Dalton in the next county. He says Galvin was a scoundrel and a terror to the countryside. And he, was, he said of Horan that he would best be removed for his own safety. And he said, I will not sacrifice any officer or man from the First Western for his cheap heroics. So it's Horan who resigned rather than the culprits for Galvin being moved out of the area. So this, I think, tells us a lot. So in Cork, a pattern of um, there, there is some degree of accountability, whereas in Kerry, you have a degree of impunity established here in September 1922. Now, zooming out again, you have executions, of course, formal executions, which are brought in in September 1922. So in part, the response to a pleas from people like Dalton, but they begin in November 1922. There's 19 executed by the end of 1922. You see this anti-treaty poster here, 19 executed by the will of the people, and so on. They're greatly expanded in January 1923, and there's 81 in total. Now, Dermot last night talked about the figure of 83. This includes kind of two unofficial ones, but it's, a re it's you know, however you count it, it's between 81 and 83, not the famous figure, inter interestingly, of 77. Anyway, moving on. In Kerry, you see the first executions, formal executions in January. Now, W. Murray Murphy intended to execute four men in Tralee, but he backed down when Humphrey Murphy, who was the local commander of the IRA here in Kerry number one, said he would shoot eight pro-treaty supporters in retaliation. So you see here again the dynamics of civil war. They're not, you know, the viciousness isn't about the treaty, it's about who does what to who. But Murphy backs down. Murphy, however, is replaced as the officer commanding in Kerry in December 22 by this man, Paddy O'Daly. And O'Daly is cut from a different cloth, as I said. He's an IRA man, praying the truce. He'd been involved in a lot of bloodshed, you know, for Michael Collins. And his attitude is very much one for one. You know, if you kill one of ours, we'll kill one of yours. And so he has the first ones executed in January 1923. There's no real trial. Um, the legislation had been modified, so you only needed two signatures from an officer at this point. And O'Daly just radios Dublin saying if he could shoot these three who had derailed a railway car in which, and causing the death of two railway drivers. He says, well, you sanctioned the death sentence. The feeling is very strong here for immediate action. Receives a message back, and they're just shot the next morning. So this is the, the monument here. Now, as 1922 turns to 1920, or, well, as January turns to February in 1923, there is an amnesty issued by the government. They suspend executions, and you do see surrenders. So again, another stereotype of the Civil War in Kerry is that no one ever surrenders. That's not the case. So for example, Liam Deasy, who was the head of the 1st Southern Division, surrenders. He calls for people under him to surrender, and 70 prisoners in Tralee sign a statement approving Deasy's order for unconditional surrender. And some columns come in. This is not the only one, but this is taken from National Army Intelligence reports. It says an irregular column surrendered to Paddy O'Daly at Ballyhague. Michael Pierce surrendered with 17 men and eight rifles. So this is going on. Oh, he's hurrying me along here. <laughs> but OK, I'll have to go a bit faster, but I'm going to stick to my main points here. At this point, though, Cork and Kerry really start to diverge. So in 1923, there's only 38 people killed in Cork. So there's more people killed in Cork before the turn of the year. In Kerry, it sees a spike in violence. But one reason is because Kerry units are still uh, more active. But another reason is basically an upsurge of reprisals in March of 1923. Now, there are reprisals in Cork. I'm going to skip through them quickly, owing to Dahi's fastidious timekeeping. But there is, for example, a, an incident in Eustacetown where prisoners are blown up, which is reminiscent of what happened in Bally City. However, nothing on the scale of what happens in Kerry. In Kerry, you have what's called as the Terror Month. So it started, as most people will be aware, with the Knock bomb. Now, five pro-treaty soldiers, including two officers from the Dublin Guard, were blown to bits by the booby trap bomb there. Paddy O'Daly says that brilliant pre truce records. So this is a classic case of the former IRA element, really, in the National Army taking revenge. So nine prisoners are taken to Bally City Crossroads, which claimed their task moving a remind barricade. In fact, of course, one of them survives. Stephen Fuller has blown clear, and he tells the true story, which is that they were tied around a mine, and the mine was blown up. This is, of course, the Bally City Memorial. There's two following reprisals in Kerry 2 Brigade, so Bally City is all members of Kerry 1. They're mined at Countess Bridge, where four prisoners were killed, and Cahir Savine, another five men. Um, by the end of the month, the National Army says they've killed 34 irregulars, and they kind of boast about this in their reports, and they say this has dented their morale and it's going to finish them off. Now, some of them are killed in combat. There's a number of considerable fights in Kerry in this month, but most of them are killed as prisoners. Either they're blown up by mines or they're shot out of hand. 
The Army response, Richard Mulcahy exonerated O'Daly. When they discovered that Stephen Fuller had, had survived the blast, the Army report said he has now become insane and he's spreading some crazy story about killing prisoners. But um, the local uh, battalion leader said, he posted notices around Tralee saying Kerry knows the truth and there seems to have been a realisation quite early on among coming the man and the IRA in Kerry about what had happened. When the, coffin, when the bodies were given back and they were shattered bodies, the coffins were broken open by the relatives in Tralee and they get put them into their own. The army famously played uh, ragtime, a jaunty tune, to taunt them. So it's got to, it's got to a stage of kind of very radical dehumanisation of the other side. Who was responsible? I'll go very quickly through this. So this is from the IRA papers. David Nelligan, the intelligence officer, is blamed for thinking up the reprisal. Um, the IRA say Lieutenant Anderson took the prisoners out of jail. Captain Clark tied them together, replaced the mine. Lieutenant Murtia threw grenades at them and uh, Captain Edward Flood detonated the mine and Joe Leonard, another former squad member, shot the one survivor who they found. In Cahir Sabine, they said it was a murder gang from Dublin, six or eight men. And when Griffin told a National Army officer, I told them to come on their knees and shot them in their knees and then blew up the bomb. Now the National Army's official, uh, official version of this is that they were killed removing the mine in an ambush of the convoy. And finally, um, there is the signature end of the Civil War in Kerry, which is the siege of Clashmeaking Cave. Um, there's three killed during the siege, as we'll hear much more about later from Fanula Walsh, but three were executed by firing squad. The one that I want to flag though, which, because it shows the viciousness that it gets to by the end, is Reginald Hathaway. He's an Englishman, uh, originally a deserter from the British Army, then the National Army, joins the IRA, uh, had actually surrendered once before, but he's caught and he's sentenced to death. He offers to show them all the arms dumps in the area, and so the files show you them taking around all the arms dumps, and then they shoot them anyway. So it's very kind of cold-blooded, the stuff that happens, especially in Kerry by the end. And as I said, you have this orgy of bloodshed in Kerry in this period, which you don't have in Cork. In Cork, it has fizzled out by now. Why is this? I think it is to do with the fact that relatively early on in Cork, there had been some accountability placed on troops, which was never put on them in Kerry. So counting the cost of 70 anti-treatyites killed in Kerry, at least 41 were executed or killed while prisoners. So a, a very high proportion. By contrast, in Cork, only 11 out of 65 anti-treatyites were killed while prisoners. Now on the other side, and this goes back to the two um, divergent interpretations of what's going on, there's nearly 200 National Army soldiers killed in Cork and Kerry. So there's actually more killed than the anti-treatyites. Roughly 60, 70 civilians killed, but actually mostly in Cork, only 14 in Kerry. So for all the viciousness of the civil war in Kerry, it's a viciousness that mostly targets combatants. But there's also a divergence in memory, and I'm gonna finish on this. So this is Todd Andrews, um, who many of you will know, uh, with Eamon de Valera, you probably will all know. Um, Andrews says in his memoir, Dublin Made Me, because Andrews is captured right at the end of the civil war, and he's in a prison in Cork, with both Cork and Kerry prisoners. And Andrews talks about a great divergence in the views of Cork and Kerry IRA prisoners. He said, in Cork, they didn't share my resentment and bitterness towards the Free Staters. They frequently expressed, expressed regret at the death of Collins. But Kerry prisoners were quite different. They regarded the Free Staters as traitors and murderers. They had no particular admiration or regret for Collins. So in this way, I think Kerry became emblematic of civil war violence. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, John. Now, our final speaker in this panel is Thomas Earls Fitzgerald, who is a historian of modern Ireland. Thomas was awarded a PhD from Trinity College in 2018, which was supported by the Irish Research Council. Since then, he has held postdoctoral fellowships from Trinity and uh, the Ireland Canada University Foundation at Concordia in Montreal. His first book, Combatants and Civilians uh, and Revolutionary Ireland, 1918-23, to uh, which focuses in particular on the experience of Kerry, was published uh, in 2021. 20, uh, it is widely available in the Kerry Library System, so I would urge you to go and borrow it. Uh, at present, Thomas holds the Royal Irish Academy Decade of Centenaries Bursary for research into political developments in Kerry in the post-war period, and that's what he's going to talk to us about uh, this morning. The title of Thomas's paper is from Bandits to Government, the move from uh, insurrection to constitutionality by anti-treaty Republicans.
Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Dahi. And yes, I'm very proud that you can get my book in Cahir Savine, um, Killarney, and Tralee branches of the Public Library Service. So, you know, go out and borrow it. And I'd also like to thank uh, Mary, Owen, and Bridget for having me down. This is the second time it's, um, I've been down in Kerry. They've invited me down to speak in Kerry. And yeah, it's wonderful to be part of uh, such an important conference. And to begin, I'm going to be talking about some fairly the kind of bare bones of some new research I've been doing about County Kerry in the post-Civil War period. And I'd like to just state from the start that I very much consider myself, you know, kind of cliche, but a historian of below, that in order to understand history, you have to understand societal shifts and what's going on in society. And I wouldn't consider myself a person who'd say that it's the great men and great women who kind of shape events, which might seem kind of ironic, because today I'll predominantly be talking about Eamon de Valera, but um, what I'm trying to get at, and I'm going to be looking at a number of speeches he made here in Tralee in the 20s and 30s, but what I hopefully can get across is that de Valera isn't simply leading, or you know, it's not just him giving out orders, or you know, him being this great man who controls affairs, it's more that he is being shaped by his audience, and he's aware of his audience, and how he needs to bring them along with him, and such. So it's very much, you know, in order to understand the, the rise and success of Fianna Fáil, I think you need to understand the, the sort of the grassroots and how that's how that very much moulds what goes on. But to begin, on the 5th of February in the town of Abbey Field in West Limerick, the Irish Labour Party held an election rally and one of the speakers was Michael Keyes. Michael Keyes had formerly been the mayor of Limerick and Keyes made a number of very interesting points that are particularly telling and relevant down through the decades. And Keyes bemoaned the fact that it seemed to him that Irish politics was now seemingly defined by just these two big groups. You have Cum na Gael, which is soon to become Fine Gael on the one side, and Fianna Fáil on the other. And Keyes was frustrated because he said, well, the Fine Gael ticket is about good government responsibility and past achievement, whereas Fianna Fáil were, we're going to be all things to all people, which I think echoes true down through the decades in terms of the political culture of both parties. But Keyes was also interesting because he, he expressed frustration where he said that it seems 10 years after the Civil War, it seems more important to these people than ever as to who did what to who and who was where in 1922. And Keyes made the point that for God's sake, we need to get over these divisions and you know the, the oath, the constitution, etc., and just move forward and work for the people of Ireland rather than just be held up by the past and these issues that actually don't affect people's day-to-day -day lives. And of course, perhaps understandably, Keyes made the point that the best party to actually work and you know, provide for the Irish people wasn't coming the way or Fianna Foyle, but the Irish Labour Party. Um, and obviously those frustrations have been commonly expressed down through the decades between like, what's the difference between Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael? Uh, for God's sake, what on earth has a civil war of 100 years ago got to do with the political identities of these parties and why are they divided on these lines when it's just not relevant anymore? And of, of course, that's a very common sentiment, but I think um, we shouldn't be in such a rush to kind of dismiss civil war politics because I think it's very important to note that the divide between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael or being a Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael person means an awful lot to a lot of people, particularly in rural Ireland, in terms of cultural identity, sense of purpose and, you know, sense of identity and such, which I think is worth understanding or worth trying to understand where that comes from. And uh, today I'll predominantly be talking about where that comes from in relation to Fianna Fáil because as in recent, I uh, reviewed Owen's excellent book recently and I made a point that as far as I'm concerned, the real winners of the Irish Civil War were Fianna Fáil in terms of being able to bring up a movement that had been entirely military defeated in many respects, politically and militarily defeated and, you know, go over and to take on, take, you know, up government and then become the defining or, you know, domineering political force in Ireland in the 20th century. So, you know, like I say, I'd very much see them as the winners of the Civil War, the ultimate winners of the Civil War. But what's interesting, I think, about Fianna Fáil is that it's inherently, or their origins are inherently about compromise in that it's about accepting the legitimacy of the free state and ultimately taking on and administering the government of the free state a government, of course, that 10 years previously, their predecessors had fought so aggressively to prevent coming into being. So I think that is inherently, that compromise and, you know, giving up on certain principles is certainly 
um, essential to phenophoil. And I'm going to be looking at that today in the context of County Kerry, because how does that actually come about? Because as John uh, so you know, eloquently just informed us, the, the Civil War was fought very brutally here, and as Owen's recent book has shown as well, events like Bally Seedy, Countess Bridge, Cahir Savine, um, the tragic Ken Mayer case, um, and just this sort of culture of almost sadism and brutality existing amongst the Dublin Guards in Kerry. And also, this was coming on the back of what had happened between 1920 and 1921. And if there was one, well, obviously there's a lot of things I was trying to achieve in my book, but one thing I was trying to really just show is just how bad the violence of the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries was here in County Kerry, whether it was here in the Siege of Tralee or the sack of Bally Longford, or also just that violence by the Black and Tans and auxiliaries was a, almost a daily occurrence here in County Kerry from 1920 to 1921. So, by 1923, County Kerry has experienced a level of violence and brutality and cruelty and bitterness and such that counties in the southeast, Leinster, much of Connacht, simply didn't experience. So County Kerry is very much uh, a place apart and such, and it obviously fosters and forges a very deep Republican identity and a very strong Republican politics emerge. So it's perhaps no surprise that outside of um, um, outside of De Valera's heartland of Kerry, of <laughs> Clare, the highest uh, success rate for the Sinn Féin, the new Sinn Féin party in the 1923 election was here in Kerry. And much of this is essentially driven by a feeling of the free state is illegitimate. It's not the government of Ireland, it's a British puppet state and we're not going to interact with it and we're not going to play its game at all and we completely reject it and we still believe in the principles we fought for in the Civil War. And it's interesting, in fact, some of the kind of complicated machinations that result in the formation of Fianna Fáil actually have their origins here in Kerry where the Cahir Savine branch of Sinn Féin make a public statement that they want all Sinn Féin TDs to make it very clear that even if the Oath of Allegiance is removed, that there is absolutely no way any of them will sit in the Dáil or enter the Free State Dáil, which I think is interesting. And then after the formation of Fianna Fáil, the Kerryman newspaper notes that the Killarney branch of Sinn Féin made it very clear that they were unhappy with the formation of Fianna Fáil, they didn't know what was happening, they regretted it, they were going to send people to Dublin to try and see what was going on, and ultimately they hoped that um, you know, De Valera's people would come back into Sinn Féin in the old kind of umbrella organization with the old same politics, no principles compromised. So you might think therefore that Fianna Fáil and Eamon De Valera in many respects have their work cut out for them in County Kerry, but it's very important that this new organization brings along anti-treaty Kerry republicanism with it. And in De Valera's first speech he makes here in Tralee on the 15th of August 1926, he makes it clear that Fianna Fáil is a civil war party and that Fianna Fáil is essentially a continuation of the civil war. So you see all these strands of continuity between 26, 27 and the earlier period. For instance, in his first speech, it's interesting to see who he's on sharing a stage with. He's sharing a stage with Humphrey Murphy, who, as John mentioned, was the OC of the Kerry No. 1 Brigade, and the Free State Forces very much felt that he was the man who was very much leading opposition to the Free State in Kerry. He's also joined by Tom McElstrom, obviously went on to be a long-serving TD. McElstrom had been the most effective flying column leader in the War of Independence. He was in the Civil War too. And he's also joined by a man the Kerry man described as P.P. Fitzgerald. I would take that to be, I'm willing to be corrected, but I imagine that's Paddy Paul Fitzgerald, who was a very influential and important figure within the IRA here in Tralee. So again, you have a sense of continuity with the old period or with the Civil War and such. It's not a break. And then I think his language is very interesting because he's essentially saying that... Um, he describes Fianna Fáil almost as a new weapon in the battle for the Civil War, that this is the new tactic. And he talks about, you know, we, we, even before they enter the Dáil, he's saying like, oh, well, we'll go there, and we, we're not going to go there to hobnob with the people, the people responsibility, the people responsible for Bally Seedy, but we're going to go there because it's the only place we can fight them, which I think is very interesting language. So it's like there's no break with the Civil War. He's trying to 
use language that makes his audience reassured that this is just a new element, a new battle of the Civil War, almost. And there's other elements of continuity um, with the old period as well. Um, he says that there's absolutely nothing communistic about Fianna Fáil, which I still find ironic, the idea that anyone would consider Fianna Fáil to be in any way communist. But, um, and he says that, but we are interested in the working people and you know, agricultural laborers and rural, rural laborers and such. And to do so isn't sectional. It's not we're working for one class. To care about the whole nation is that what we're about. We care for everyone because we are representative of the entire nation and such. And you might think that that somehow, sorry, I'm still getting over a bit of chest infection. Um, um, perhaps he's sort of like, he's aware that he's seemingly talking to a rural and conservative audience and such, but I don't necessarily think that's the case. In his private correspondence at this time, he's worried that free state politics will, you know, emerge between, you know, you would have Cumann the Whale and the Farmers Party representing the upwardly mobile and fairly wealthy people, and then you would have the Labour Party representing um, agricultural and rural labor, uh, agricultural laborers and the industrial working class and such, so a kind of clear, straight, left-right divide, which seems perfectly sensible. But then his idea is like, well, it wouldn't leave a room for the party that represents the nation, the old tradition of fighting the British, that you, know, you have to have a, a national party that represents the entire nation and such. And that's his rhetoric again, because much of the success of Sinn Féin between 1917 and 1921 was this idea that come on in, this is a party for everyone, um, and you know, once we achieve national freedom, then all these kind of problems about class and poverty will you know, magically go away and such. And so he's, he's, he's kind of tapping back into that rhetoric as well of, you know, well, the Cosgrave government isn't a national government, but I will lead a national government, and then if we bring all of our people along with us, then these you know, social ills will magically disappear. So again, this is a direct continuity with the older period of this idea that Sinn Féin is the civil war party and also Sinn Féin, Fianna Fáil is, the civil, is a civil war party but it also is making connections to the older Sinn Féin party as well. So again, you have a sense of continuity but also in relation to the audience as well. It's about, he wants the entire audience to come along with him that everyone has a place here or something as opposed to, you know, the only people who are seemingly being excluded are, you know, would be very strong come in the whale and Cosgrave supporters and such. So. I think that 1926 speech is very interesting. It's very kind of gung-ho, all guns blazing, Fianna Foil is the new weapon in the Civil War and such. And obviously, um, events take their course. In 1927, uh, Fianna Foil does enter the Doyle, and then by February 1932, they're poised to actually take over the administration of the Free State, which is, again, ironic, considering that, you know, this was the state that they had fought uh, very hard for it not to come into being. And obviously, when he next comes to Tralee in February 1932, his rhetoric isn't quite as gung-ho as previously. So um, there's far more of an emphasis on bread and butter issues, the failures of the government emigration, um, some of the still kind of like, we're not communist stuff as well. But in 1926, there's this incredible focus on the Civil War, whereas obviously by 1932, it's 10 years later, um, the emphasis there isn't quite as strong, of course. But he still mentions it, and he says that in 1922, the Cosgrave, or the government then, achieved power through a military, undemocratic military coup. That's the, how they achieved power, was through a coup. And, and it was achieved through force. And then all of the subsequent um, coercion acts the government have in introduced is about maintaining their power through force. That this is a government that its entire, its, its power rests on military force in, a, in terms of achieving and maintaining power, and therefore it is the government, but it's illegitimate and such. And I think most sensible people would argue that that actually isn't the case in terms of, you know, Cosgrave's government was legitimate and was democratically elected and such, but he is trying to, he's still the audience, he's aware of the anti-treaty audience he has in front of him, and he's basically saying to them, yes, you were right in 1922, you were right, we were fighting something that was unjust, and we're still fighting it now. So he's still very much aware of the audience and shaping his rhetoric to reflect the values and ideas of his audience. And then perhaps understandably, in 1933, after he's come to power, there's considerably less uh, 
emphasis on the Civil War, and he talks about the need for loyalty and discipline behind the government of the Ser Stott. It's interesting in that period, he still can't say free state, so he says Ser Stott instead, which I, it, again, it's just funny, and I just, I enjoy all the ironies of this period and such. But um, just to kind of wrap up and such, we can ask ourselves, like, how do we understand this? On one hand, the experience of county, the anti-treaty position on the anti-treaty side in the Civil War is crucial to Fianna Fáil's credibility in terms of maintaining its link with the Civil War, in terms of maintaining its anti-treaty credentials and such. And having and being able to bring along the majority, not most of the anti-treaty sentiment in uh, County Kerry shows that how reliant people like De Valera are on this part of the country and parts of the country that experience this. So on one level, you might think he's kind of looking after, he's in the center looking after the periphery or something, but it's also, it's more like the periphery is controlling him and he needs the periphery, even though I'd be very uh, skeptical about that word periphery because of course, I think most people in the audience would agree the County Kerry isn't the periphery, it is the center. But um, <laughs> so yeah, so on that level, that's something that we should understand. But we should also go back to Michael Keyes in that cold night in Abbey Field in February 1932. So in private, Eamon de Valera, um, uh, in when he met William O'Brien, who'd been a former Home Rule MP, um, he admitted to O'Brien in the autumn of 1922 that what the anti-treaty side were doing in terms of sabotage, attacking civilian in infrastructure and such, could be interpreted as, in his own words, banditry. And banditry is essentially a political armed crime, which I think is telling because um, the free state side throughout the Civil War, their modus operandi or how they tried to convey the importance of their cause was by saying the anti-treaty side is, doesn't have a democratic mandate, it's a political armed crime. Um, used to kind of dismantle the living functioning of a living nation and such. And I think it's kind of ironic that Eamon de Valera also uses the term banditry to, just, to talk about his own side. And so that's the kind of interesting thing that I would also, I think, leave you with is that, okay, yes, there is a sense of him being shaped by his audience and his, his needing of his audience to build this new movement and such. But is, also, isn't it just cynical and exploitative in terms of um, essentially perpetuating divisions, uh, making the Civil War memory, not trying to heal divisions, but essentially perpetuate them and continue them to prevent any reconciliation. And ultimately, in some respects, you could argue that all of these Civil War divisions and how they were perpetuated and exploited essentially prevent the country from moving forward and prevent Ireland from having a better future. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, thank you, Thomas. We've had three superb uh, contributions this morning, and now we've about 15 minutes for uh, questions from the floor. Could I ask that you wait until a microphone is given to you, just so we can all hear your question, and so that the speakers can also hear the questions? Yeah, so one question here. Hi, uh, Nora Murhu Fires. A question for John. Um, regarding the Demino situation that developed between Kerry and Dublin, do you not think there's a chance that the origins of that happened in 1921 with the dispute between Kerry number one and Dublin? Yeah, so Thomas can actually say more about this than I can because he's really looked into the war of independence in Kerry, but yeah, like. I think you're, what I think you're alluding to is the fact that GHQ actually sends down a Dublin officer, you know, to try to sort them out as they see it and carry people really resent this. It certainly contributes to it. I mean, the only thing I will say, though, in mitigation a little bit is there is a carry number one that's pro-treaty too. So there is a carry number one led by Ned Horan, who I mentioned in my talk. Um, my sense of it is that it's the behaviour of Dublin troops in Kerry that really you know, sets people against them. You know, they're undisciplined, they treat people badly, and in some cases they seem to have a kind of a condescending attitude to them and things like this. But they're also not so much the regular 
enlisted men as the officers have been through a very brutal period. So they've been through a lot of face-to-face -face killing, and this is their mentality. So if one of ours gets killed, we're going to go and take revenge. So I would say that it's that that's that's the kernel of why the civil war is so vicious and carried. But certainly the dispute in 1921 doesn't help. I, Thomas probably can say a bit more about that than me. Yeah. Thomas, do you want a, a quick? Uh, yeah, briefly. Is the mic working? Yeah. yeah no, it is interesting that. Um, in 1921, the IRA structure becomes more professionalized and codified and such in the formation of you know, divisions and such, with Liam Lynch becoming the OC of the first uh, Southern Division. And throughout the War of Independence, County Kerry under, particularly Kerry number one under Paddy Cattle, had a particularly bad relationship with GHQ. But you know, they also had a particularly poor relationship with people who would also go on to be on the anti-treaty side as well, like Liam Lynch and such. So Kerry is very much stubborn and independent and such. And I do think that's Kerry IRA structures itself in terms of you know being independent, not wanting to you know be left alone in some respects. And I think that is certainly that independent streak is certainly an element of how the civil war plays out here. Certainly. Just one more thing on that. I mean, you yeah. know, not not to go into Kerry stereotypes, but there is a thing where people fall out an awful lot in Kerry in the IRA, like in the. <laughs> In the Civil War as well, you have like certainly what the National Army reports say is like you know uh, Humphrey Merton couldn't get on with John Joe Rice or John Joe Sheehy, etc. You know, they seem, and they wouldn't talk to each other during the Civil War. They wouldn't cooperate. So whatever the reason is, the Carrier IRA seem to have been particularly like headstrong. A lot of them, you know. I Thanks, John. I'm just going to yeah. leave <laughs> Bill Kazan a uh, question for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a message. Um, first, or sorry, a, a question. Firstly, for Thomas. Um, you talked about the advantages of seeing Fianna Fáil from a bottom-up perspective and Fianna Fáil wanting to take as many people with them as possible, but there's also a huge degree of elitism in the party in the sense that at the top of Fianna Fáil right up to, I suppose, Jack Lynch becoming Taoiseach in 1966, it's really a cohesive and very small elite that seemed to be controlling everything. And I'm wondering, could you say something about, because this is something we see in other movements, like in Britain, the tension between the Labour movement and the Parliamentary Labour Party, like is often a tension between radical left politics and a very moderate centrist politics. And maybe there's something to that in, in, in the case of Fianna Fáil. And also, if I can, for, for John, um, you talked about in, in the autumn of, of 22, the IRA campaign showing signs of success um, and retaking a number of towns, including Ken Mayer. But my question would be, how long did they keep these towns? So Thomas, we start with you. Yeah, I might start first. So there is a kind of dichotomy or irony about Fianna Fáil in terms of it, you know, being based on the common and in terms of being, you know, an organisation based on the grassroots. But it's an incredibly centralised organisation in terms of leadership structure at the top, and as you mentioned. You know, various families in many respects are powerful individuals having a very defining voice in it for a long time, and you know, Hawkey having a connection with Lamas and things like that. But there's still, I think it's interesting that that rhetoric that I was talking about that De Valera is using in the 20s through the 30s of just reminding them that this is the Nationalist Party, we fought the Civil War, we fought the War of Independence, I was a leader in 1916 and you know, paying lip service to anti-partitionist sentiment. So you have people who have, you have a deeply structured and codified organization, but it's kind of being fed the juice of you know, the intoxicating beverage of, you know, don't forget where we come from, republicanism and such. And obviously that comes crashing down in 1969 in terms of you know, far more of a problem for Fianna Fáil than Fianna Gael in terms of, well, isn't this what we're all about? And you know the arms crisis and such, and I think it's still you know Fianna Fáil today and its relationship to Sinn Féin and such is like where do they actually stand? What do we believe in? Because we're we're constantly reminded that this is where we come from and this is what we're about. But what's its relationship to today? Thanks, Tom. John. Yeah. Um, so in direct answer to your question, first of all, uh, so in the case of Ken Mayer, they hold it for about three months. Um, so part, so? Yeah, but it's, it's only retaken in December by a big kind of army effort now. When the army mounts major efforts, the IRA generally don't um, oppose them because they know this is the way to, to destroy themselves. But places like Canmare, and I also referenced Clifton, are in anti-treaty possession for a couple of months. Now, Dundalk, which I also mentioned, is only in anti-treaty hands for a matter of days you know, before it's abandoned. But I mean, I, I use the example of towns as kind of um, you know, to show that it's not all one way. But like, 
when I say that the anti-treaty IRA is coming back in a sense in the autumn of 1922, I'm really not talking about taking back territory, it's the attrition, they're causing casualties, they're sabotaging the railways, the roads, they're preventing tax collection. I think that was the strategy and that had possibly a chance of success. There wasn't really a chance of them retaking territory though in any, in any major way. Thanks. Mary. Thanks, and a wonderful panel. Thank you all very much. I suppose I want to you know, come back to what I do, is, is talk about the coming of Mon, and, and it's a question that goes across the three of you. Like for instance, Liz, when Carl Brewer is killed, Kathleen Brewer, his widow, insists that only the women are around his body because she can't trust that the ideological purity, the Republican purity of men would be, you know, who might uh, form a bodyguard would, would, could be trusted, basically. Um, and, and with Thomas, uh, is there any, a way in a sense that de Valera is preaching to the crowd um, when he comes to Kerry, firstly, um, in, in 23? Uh, because in um, August, when Cosgrave came to give a speech in Tralee, um, he, was, he was jeered. There was a big march of, of uh, dozens of Kamenaman women who carried coffins with the names of the dead of the Ballysidi massacre. Um, and they totally disrupted uh, any uh, the Gael meetings. And now Tralee is seen as a particularly Republican town. But you know, coming to Kerry, he's already, you know, there, there, is, there, is, there are ears that are ready to listen to what he has to say. And then, John, I, I think that's great you're doing the uh, Civil War Dead in the way that uh, uh, Dahi and, and Union did the um, Dead of the Irish Revolution. It's really important. But in some ways, does that skew then how we remember how the suffering of women? Because there are more women killed in, in the Civil War, uh, particularly anti-treaty militant women. But you know, you generally don't get deaths among women, and they're not extra, there are no extrajudicial killings. So you know, while it's good to remember how many people were killed and name them, does that cover up maybe the civilian suffering and the gendered suffering of that period? Thanks, Mary. Liz, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, so what's interesting about the Carl Brewer funeral is that it is his widow that insists that the coming of Mon play that role. Um, because as the Civil War goes on, there is no choice. The women actually have to perform that role of, you know, carrying out the funerals, organizing the funerals, being the, you know, firing the gunshots over the graves and so on. They're shown a more militant role because it's too dangerous for the men to do that. And there's, again, amazing photographs. We're so lucky with the photographs um, of the procession of Cattle Brew's funeral and it is coming them on. It is the Fianna um, that are there leading this funeral. And even the women, the women themselves, like the pride that they have of being asked to perform this duty, this, this sacred duty, because Cattle Brew is so, such a, a, an important figure to, to them. Um, and even with Linda Cairn, she is there by his side. She won't, there are a number of women that refuse to leave Brewer at the Granville as well. Um, so it is just interesting that at Brewer's funeral, it is they are specifically requested for that duty. But then as the civil go war goes on, they have to fulfill that duty. And you know yourself, Mary, the women become more dangerous. Um, propaganda, as you said about Tralee, they are so dangerous at carrying out an effective uh, propaganda, that that is the real threat with them. Hence, we see the mass arrests then, January, February, March, 1923. But yeah. Thanks, Liz. Tom. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, that's very interesting that like Cosgrave does receive a particularly poor welcome here in 1923. And then obviously, of course, in the early 1930s, like the worst clashes between the blue shirts and Fianna Fáil IRA is here in Tralee which is really brutal, you know, the town being almost ripped apart for a day and such. Um, so there is that sentiment, and I think in terms of, you know, producing, you know, a very core Republican vote, and also a kind of strong anti-free state vote that persists as well. I've always found it, like, interesting that for a long time, Labour did a lot better here than Fine Gael. Uh, but it's also, you know, obviously, but De Valera understands that, you know, he has willing ears, but he's also, what I was trying to do is kind of subtly for this front of, oh, we're the same as ever, but we're actually changing, and we're actually going to take over the Free State. And the other thing, of course, is that there was a lot of people in Sinn Féin and the IRA who didn't go on with de Valera into Fianna Fáil, and that was particularly strong here in Tralee as well. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, Mary, that's a very good point. I mean, so 
I would say that we need to count the casualties because we haven't done it. You know, but you're absolutely right. The civil war is not only about fatal violence. Um, there's also all other kinds of violence. And, it, and you're right <coughs> again in that it does skew the civil war towards a kind of masculine reading of it. You know, brother against brother and soldier against soldier. Now, in terms of fatal violence, that's largely true, more so than the War of Independence. But one thing that's very strong in the military papers, which I've, I've been looking at, is over and over again, especially in Kerry, but you can, you can trace it right throughout the country, the army says there would be no civil war if it wasn't for these crazy women who would come in the man. You know, they, they, and it's like, you, you see it once and you think, okay, that's an aberration or whatever, but they say it all the time. They say, because so essentially when, you're, when, we're, when we get to writing, I think, in, uh, a new history of the civil war with all the new sources we have, you know, you're going to have to say that there was no anti-treaty campaign without coming to man. Coming to man are a central part of it. They're not just an auxiliary. And so in terms of violence, you're going to have to look at a whole load of other categories because generally, yeah, women aren't killed. And, and part of that is, is people's ideas about masculinity and violence at the time. Um, but women do suffer a lot. They're, they're harassed. They're put in jail. And as, as you're examining yourself, Mary, sometimes they're subjected to, to sexual assault. So it's something we have to look into more. You're absolutely right. Civil wars are not just about fatal violence. Thanks, Anne. There's uh, another question. Row D. Um, just, just wait till we get the microphone to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I think if you look at the, um, like there's a perception often that the, of the, the, you know, that it was the military side of the conflict which dominates. Um, and and that, that narrative leads out, like Mary was saying, leads out a whole lot of other issues. And um, I mean, I would argue, for instance, in the War of Independence, um, at certain times the labour movement was leading the way and made the country ungovernable. I mean, the general strikes, the, the boycott and so on. The question then is, like, I mean, if you focus on the IRA just, it's like an elite group of guerrillas leading the way on behalf of the rest of the population. So it leaves out then the, for instance, in my, my, from my perspective, the working class. And what did they have to say? I mean, one question would be, what were the working class doing in the Civil War? Now, I mean, I'm not going to go on. To, there was various strikes or so, national strikes. But if you to look at it from the military side of view, they're not seen at all. So, I mean, the question then is that, was there another way? And I think, really, it goes back to, it really goes back to 1916 and the killing of uh, Connolly and Larkin was in America, so that you, you didn't have what I would call a party that was going to challenge Sinn Féin. I mean, the Labour Party essentially didn't challenge Sinn Féin to the leadership of the national movement, and that spread into the Civil War then, and it basically became part of what it wanted, really, the leadership, was to be part of the establishment, and it got that, to sort of de facto recognising the Republic. But the point I'm, I'm making, though, that um, if it wasn't for the... Um, that the only movement capable of bringing about a Republic, and really a workers' Republic, because that was the only way you'd get a difference, was was the working class, was the working class movement. A guerrilla war, a guerrilla army could never do that. It simply couldn't do it on its own. Um, I mean, the railway boycott, for instance. Just sorry, to give our speakers uh, an opportunity to respond to you. Yeah. Um, does any, first. Charles, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, no, I think that is the alternative history of the Civil War and the War of Independence that has been written out. In, in, for instance, the spring of 1922, this general strike against militarism where the labor movement was saying that, well, we don't really just, we don't want the country to set these two small elitist military groups bringing the country in a direction we don't want it to be when we have people immigrating, we have people starving and such. And you do, I think it's very interesting that up until 2011, the Labour Party had their best election in 1922. And I don't think, you know, and people who voted for the Labour Party or the Farmers Party was, it was on the basis of, we want an end to violence, we want stability, we want our interest to be looked after and represented in the Doyle. And, you know, you could say it's part of William O'Brien's kind of conservative leadership in terms of just building up union strength and not working on the Labour Party itself. And I think uh, another important element is that, like, our, like, in terms of the lack of success of the Labour movement in Ireland traditionally is that for better or worse, Ireland is a predominantly non-industrialized society, whereas kind of conservative values of Eamon de Valera appealed to a large section of the audience and such, and that together with that, that the Labour Party never had um, 
it never went very radical or it, 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 didn't, it seemed to carve out a certain niche for itself and such as well. So, but I think certainly um, that moment in 1922 was one of the great what ifs of the labor movement and if they had pushed it further and such. And, you know, again, perhaps it ties into Eamon de Valera's ability to appeal to a broader section that after 1922 through the 20s, the, the Labour Party in terms of electoral success just keeps declining. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, John or, or Lee? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I quickly I'd say, number one, I mean, when we're writing the history again, the, the working class and the labour movement have to be written back in, absolutely. Um, Thomas mentioned the general strike against militarism, which is emblematic, I think, of the Labour Party anyway, and their um, approach to the Civil War, which was this whole thing should be avoided, and the Labour Party was very uncomfortable with executions and so on. Um, the anti-treatyites actually blamed the Labour Party, though they said they should have boycotted the club. But in terms of the Workers' Republic, I mean, I, w I would say two things. Number one, the, is the issue of the day, the great issue of the day, rightly or wrongly, in Ireland was national independence, and that's not a small thing. It's not a, it's not a thing that can be wished away, I think. And secondly, so, the, so what I'm saying is, you know, the, I think it's a mistake to write over the politics of nationalists or republicans of that era, because, you know, it's, it's, that is the big issue of the day, as far as the majority of people are concerned. Now, Secondly, um, if we look at a workers' republic, what did that mean? You know, nobody had a clear idea of what that meant. Um, Fianna Fáil even sometimes used the, the phrase of workers' republic in the election of, or proto Fianna Fáil, the Sinn Féin further, in 1923. So I, I kind of think the workers' republic is a dream. I don't think anything like that is possible in Ireland. Ireland doesn't have an industrial base, so you can't nationalise it because there's nothing there. Um, in terms of land redistribution, a lot of that is actually done. So a lot of it is done, uh, first of all, by the Free State in 1923. Uh, and later on by the Land Commission and so on. So uh, that would be my view. The Labour movement has to be written back in, absolutely. There's a big strike wave right at the end of the Civil War and part of the army used to put it down. It's a big part of the story. But I don't think that the Labour movement is an alternative pole of you know, state formation. I just don't believe that's the case.